Hello. I would like to thank first for having me here, and also in particular I'd like to thank Daniel and Paul to, for nudging the organizers to accept me. I wasn't original planned to come here, so that's a really great honor to be able to, to talk to you today. What I would like to present is, uh, is a library I've been working on for quite a while, which is called GIU. And GIU allows you to create cross-platform GUI programs in pure Go. So instead of having, for example, much of your backend code written in Go and perhaps some of your so-called lower level code uh, written in Go, and then on top of that, you have written your user interface, your graphical user interface in, in say, the Java libraries or in React or something else that you have to then connect with your Go program, you can, with Gio, just write everything in Go. So I've been working on something like that for quite a while in the sense that I haven't worked on GIU for more than one and a half, almost two years. But I've been working for quite a while to bring Go into user interfaces, which I think is a very, very underutilized uh, under, under area of using Go. So Go is used everywhere on the back end, but very, very little on the so-called front end. I know it's used for web applications, but for really old-fashioned um, apps and, and desktop programs, it's not very widespread. So I began to push for it in 2013, where I wanted to just have anything running on the Android phone. And in 2014, Go, Mo Go Mobile appeared, which allowed you to connect your existing Go code with something that you had already written in, in another language. So you can have an Android application or an iPhone application and have some of that written in Go. And I tried to push that a little bit further with the, my .go talk, which tried to be to, to access the Java or Objective-C or Swift libraries directly, as you would do in Seco. If you know Seco, you can import uh, uppercase C, and then you can ax access um, C functions and types and so on from Go directly. And that's what I tried to do with the reverse bindings. Well, it did work, but the problem is that you, if you've ever used anything like uh, Go Mobile or Seco in, in particular, you've probably seen that it quite quickly introduces problems where you have one side of the world which is written in C or Java or something else, and then you have your Go world, and each and every time you have to cross that language barrier, you r run in, not in problems, but as your program grows, you have more and more references across this barrier, and that leads to complexities like reference cycles, where you can have references across that, uh, a cycle of references across that barrier, which will not be garbage collected, even though Go is no, uh, a garbage collected language, and so on. So I decided in, I think it was early 2017, uh, to say, let's go away from Go Mobile, the Go Mobile style way of writing apps, and let's try to write everything in Go. So that means the drawing, the input handling, the window managing, and everything. And that's what that's what the GIO library tries to accomplish. It's still very, very new because it, I only released it in March, so it's not there yet, but it does what I think a lot of interesting things. And a part of that is that it can actually um, uh, create a program that is, uh, that is uh, useful enough for you to use. So what I have uh, for you today is the program called Scatter. And Scatter is a program for end-to-end -end encrypted messaging, except instead of using your phone numbers, I'll just show it here, instead of using, so it looks pretty much like any other chat program, but it's written in, in pure Go and it runs on the Q library. And instead of using your phone numbers as identifiers and some proprietary service for message transport, it simply uses your existing SMTP and IMAP server for uh, sending messages back and forth. But the interesting part about Scatter is that it's, as I said, pure Go. It's written with no native code uh, in its Scatter project itself. Everything is handled by the GU library, and still it functions as what you would say a good old-fashioned desktop app on Mac OS. So let's try, this is, this is the Scatter 3 account, using the Scatter 3 account, and Scatter 1 happens to be connected to the iPhone simulator, so let's say hello to the iPhone simulator and I'll send it. It's a bit small, I know this, the text is a bit small, but it looks like a chat, uh, chat app, and you have the chat history here, 
and you have your contacts here. So let's take the simulator up and start the scatter app. And as you can see, the message appeared in the bottom. It's, it's a bit, bit difficult to see, but I can tell you that it did appear. And of course, <laughs> you can write it back and say hello back. You can tell from the, the history that I've done this quite a lot of times. Hello back from iPhone, like this, and it should appear up here. And while we wait for that, we also have the Android emulator. There it was, hello back from iPhone. So we have the Android em emulator here, where we can again write a message to the Mac OS, hello Mac OS from Android. So, whoops. So this is actually a, a functioning program. It's a preview. It doesn't have that many features, but it does have, it does have scrolling. It does have um, the edit fields. It does support the soft keyboard and so on. So it does a lot of interesting things. And it's actually so, that f so functional that, it is, um, that I've released it in the App Store. So even Apple accepted this app on, at least on the as a test flight build. So if you go to the website for this program, you will actually be able to download it on your phone with, if you have an Android or an, or an iPhone. Now, what are the features of GIU today? I think the most important one is that it's written in something that is called immediate mode design. I will get back to that in a moment. But in the background, it's written so it's very, very portable through only using very, very little from the platform. So instead of using all the platform's native widgets, say the iPhone text editor and the label and the buttons and so on, it simply depends on somewhere to draw on and access to your graphics card so that, that it can display hardware accelerated graphics. And of course, it also depends on some way to get user input in the form of clicks and mouse moves and keyboard input. Um, one consequence of being in an immediate mode design it's, is that it has to be very efficient. I'll tell you in a moment why, but so the, the consequence is that you have to be careful about uh, creating too much garbage. So some of the design choices has actually been done with, uh, with, with uh, this constraint in mind. So most, if not all, of the drawing and layout code in this library is designed so it will not generate any garbage, so you won't have any troubles from the garbage collector. At, at least not from GIU, your program could still generate too much garbage. And because it has so few dependencies, it already runs on all the three major platforms, uh, desktop platforms, as well as the mobile platforms, and it actually has the ability to be built as a web assembly and web, uh, web GL program so that it can run directly from the browser. I, all of this from the same code base. Uh, yeah, this is the scatter. Uh, homepage and, and links to the App Store builds. So now I would like to attempt to show you the design choices of GUI that makes it, in, at least in my eyes, very simple to write GUI programs, even from, the scra from scratch, from the ground up. So let's start with a very, very simple main Go. And we'll just have the package main, and we'll have the func main. And this is the program th that you're used to seeing, uh, main. This is a program that you're used to seeing, starting with if you're writing, a, let's say, a command line tool or a web server or anything like this. And the first thing that you have to do to write a GUI program is that you have to give up your main Go routine. And that's an that's a con that's a unfortunate consequence of the way that UI libraries work. The native UI libraries and window management system works on some platforms, so I don't think there's anything we can do about that. That also introduces um, oops. The only package, package app, which is the only package that actually deals with the low-level platform. All the other packages are written in pure Go. So we're giving up the main control, main Go routine to the system, so we have to do all this fun stuff in a Go routine. Whoops, like this. And the first thing you would like to do is create a new window. And to actually have a responsive window, you have to run its event loop, which means that you have to accept all the events that come in the channel of system events. And system events are events like resizes and uh, keyboard input and so on. So let's just range through the event queue like this and see what happens. And this is just running with go run. It go runs this file that I'm editing. And as you can see, it 
returns, uh, the result is a functional, a blank, yet functional window with just that, those few lines, which behave like you would accept any, uh, expect any other application to behave. Now, to actually draw something interesting in here, you have to tell GIU what you would like to have displayed on your display, uh, in your window. And the, the way you do that is to react to the most important event type in, in GIU, which is the update event. So let's just switch on the type of, uh, of the event. Let's pull out the event here and switch on the type. And say if we, if we receive an update event, then we would like to draw something or at least update the window state. And drawing and update the window is done through Windows update method. And let's just end that here. But to tell update what you want to have displayed in an immediate mode design, you can't just take, if you're used to some other uh, widgets, uh, widget toolkits and in other languages, you might be used to having an implicit tree and a hierarchy of widgets. So say you have your window on top and then you have containers as children to that window and below those containers you have widgets and so on. So to actually have something drawn, you have to put in buttons and, and labels and text editors and so on. With an immediate mode design, you simply specify from the time on, from the time you start, to, uh, from, from the beginning to the end, the entire content of, content of the view. And the way you do that in, in GIU is to specify the drawing and input and so on through operations. And one operation I would like to, the most simple one for demonstration is the paint operation, just to be concrete. It describes an area where you want to have drawn the current material. And the current material could be a color, it could be an image, at least for now, uh, further down the road, it could be a gradient, something, something like that. So a paint operation takes a rectangle, a floating point rectangle. Where you have to specify, let's just say the max, so just have the size of it. And let's say it's 500 times 600 pixels, like this. And then, of course, just specifying the operation is not enough. You also have to add it to the operations buffer that, we've, that we're defining. Uh, in a moment, I'll just import like this. So, so this down here is an operations buffer that, that the paint operation will serialize it itself into. And we'll just define it in the beginning. And this operation buffer is also what you give to windows.update, like this. So let's just import the package, like this. So let's see it running. Yes. So this is a very boring rectangle, but the, <laughs> uh, but the concept still stands. You define operations, and you add them to an operations buffer which we have up here, and you give that entire buffer to windows.update, and it will replace whatever was present there with the, the updated operations buffer. And that's, that's, the that's the style and idea by an immediate mode design. You don't have any state hidden in the library. You have every state controlled and owned by your application. And that becomes important as your program grows, and you want to update it in a way that fits your application, and not in a way that fits the user interface library. So let's do something a little more interesting. Uh, delete this uh, operation. Um, uh, let's draw some text. And to draw some text, you have to have a font loaded and some other support uh, things. So I made the package symbol, which makes it simple here on stage, that can, symbol, that can create labels and, and other widgets for you. So let's import it. The gophercon symbol package. And that theme you can then use to create a label. Let's say hello world, just to keep it uh, safe. And then you also have to specify a font size. Let's say it's like, uh, 46. And to draw this one, you have to give it the operations buffer, because it has to put its drawing somewhere. And you also have to specify the constraints of this widget. And we just call it constraints here. I'll get back to what constraints, is in, uh, constraints are in a moment. But for now, let's just create rigid constraints given through the size of this one. 
So again, create a theme, which could be the material theme. In our case, it's just a very simple theme that, that makes very simple widgets. And you create this widget, which is stateless. So you just create it on the fly as you draw, and saying, I would like to draw Hello World, and we'll draw, draw in this size. And you ask that to draw itself to the operations buffer, which is then passed to the window.update. Of course, I forgot something. You have to reuse the, to be garbage free, you have to reset the operations buffer to reuses from update to update. All right. Okay, we'll have to extract size at the end here. And. Right. Whoops. Okay, one more thing. <laughs> the theme also know, has to know the, the configuration of your window. So it has to know what's the, the, what's the, the resolution of your window so that the, when you draw a label, it will have the same size across all types of screens. So it has to know it in the reset method, the configuration, and you're getting this configuration with all the uh, information through the config object on the sizing event. Like this. So after all this work, we have the hello world. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> and one thing I'd like to uh, point out with this hello world is that the label is actually able to do line wrapping. And that gets back to where we have the constra constraints defined for it. So the constraints are giving uh, are specified according to the size of this window, uh, which we have up here, these constraints. So the constraints tell the label what are the available sizes for you. So constraints contains in the width and the height dimensions contains what's the minimal and maximum sizes in, that, in, those, in those dimensions that you can take up a space. So as the constraints uh, get smaller, then the label is forced to, do, to, to line wrap. Now, let's say you'd only, uh, you want to draw two labels. Let's say you draw two labels here. And we have the number two. Whoops, number S, number two. Number one. And if you just do that, of course, the labels will appear on top of each other. And the job of placing widgets relative to each other and relative to the edges of your container or your window is handled by the layout system. And in uh, Giu, the layout system is inspired by Flutter. If any of you has used Flutter before, it's actually the constraints is the same thing as in Flutter, where you have constraints that you give to widgets. And as a result of laying out itself, the widgets will give back your, uh, to you the actual dimensions that it chose. So in this example, we actually can get the dimensions back from the first label, just to show you how you would manually lay out. And then we can use that to extract the height of the first label. And I know that it's going to be converted to a float by using, taking the size from the dimensions in the y direction. And then we can take that and offset with another operation called transform operation, where you can offset it with the floating point point in the y direction, height pixels. I think that's OK. And then, of course, you have to add it to the operations buffer. No, you didn't. Like this. Whoops, it's gone. OK, and uh, one more thing. <laughs> one more thing. This constraints tells, uh, by saying rigid constraints, it tells that the minimum and maximum size is the same, and you have to fill the entire screen. So the first label actually takes up the entire space. So we'll loosen the constraints a little bit by saying the minimum height can be zero. So the first label here is allowed to be as, as tall as it needs to be. Let's try again. And there you go, two labels. And you can see even though the first label resizes itself and changes height, the, the other one will follow. So that's the basics of the layout operation. Of course, doing that, as you can tell from, from this demo, is tedious and error prone. So instead of using manual offsetting and so on, you will use layout, various layout helpers which are available in the Geo library. And one of those helpers is alignment. So let's try and use that. The way you use alignment is you initialize it with a direction, which, which can either be one of the compass directions or simply saying, in this case, 
that we'd like to center it. Like this. And you give it the original constraints, and you get back from an alignment operations a modified set of constraints that you give to that widget that you like to be centered, to have centered. So that's what pops up over here. And finally, you need to end it by giving the alignment operator or helper the dimensions of the widget so it knows how much to offset it to actually center it. Whoops, and let's see if that actually works. It does, first try. Now, there are also more complicated, for example, more complicated layout helpers available. Let's say you want to have multiple widgets aligned with each other and place them on a row, for example. And uh, for this example, let's use just regular rectangulars, uh, rectangles, uh, colored rectangles. So one thing you can do is, if you have a rectangle and you have a color, let's say green, and you want, just want to lay it out, it will, if everything works correctly, oops, take out the entire screen space like this. So say you have many widgets, widgets. This is one widget, and you have many widgets that you want to place on a row. You will use the flex layout. The flex, la flex layout is similar to the align layout in that you have to initialize it. And you have to tell, now I want to add a child. In other frameworks, you might add a child to this flex. Here you just say, specify that I want a child of this flex layout. And in this case, we'll, we'll just make it fill up, take up half the space of the screen. So, uh, like this. Half the space of the screen. And then, of course, you need the dimensions again from your widget and end by calling end dims. And finally, you are retu you're returned an object that you then use to lay out all these children. You will just start with one of them to see that it actually works. like this, taking up half the screen, and say you want to add another one. We'll just copy this. Uh, say we'll add another one with the color blue. In this case, we'll just give it half of the remaining space, which is a quarter of the total space. Like this. So as you can see, laying out widgets and declaring widgets and just drawing something on the screen is very, very immediate in, in immediate mode design. You don't add it to a tree. You don't have a hierarchy of containers. You don't have any state hidden in your library. You just create what you want to have created and drawn and s tell it to draw. And that's actually how you structure larger programs, except that when you reach for widgets that actually have state, which needs to be retained across updates, instead of have these two static rectangles or a static uh, list of labels, you might have something that react to user in input. And one such example is the list. And the list is a widget that can lay out uh, other widgets um, like the flex layout that you saw here, but instead of having all of them laid out, you have perhaps a potentially very, very large list, and you only want to show some of them, and you want the user to be able to scroll through what part of this large list that you want to have visible. So let's get back to the, to the label, like this. And let's create a list. So because this list has state, you have to have a handle or uh, you have to retain it somewhere. But it's the, again, this is, this is the job for your application. The, the Geo libraries does not decide how or where you want to store this reference. So we have a layout list. And um, you give it an axis. In this case, we want to have it vertically. 
And to use it, you simply initialize it. You give it the configuration. You give it the input queue where the events come in, the operations for storing its operations, and of course, the constraints that it has to contain itself into, inside. And this queue is where all the events appear from the gear system to your program and to the widgets that need those events. And the default queue is simply the one that is supplied by the window. And with all that set up, you can simply run through this list and only have to display and work on those, that are those child elements that are actually visible. So you say, as long as the list has more elements to show, we'd like to have the next one. And inside this for loop is simply where you draw this child element. In this case, we just draw an, uh, a label. So let's make it a little bit more interesting by saying the label must be dependent on the index of the list. So we'll just say, OK, this is the index. And the index is, is returned from the index method from the list. And you also have to use the, the, the constraints that the list specifies you for the child element. So that is contained in the constraints method. And with that, and finally, you tell the list that the child took up this much space. And I think that's it. Mm -hmm. Not enough arguments to... Oh, yeah. You actually have to tell it how large, how, what is the size of your backing list. Let's say you have thousands or ten thousands of elements. This no. Just like this. Okay. There you go. So you have ten thousands of elements, but only the ones that are actually shown are being processed and drawn. So you can have millions or t tens of millions of elements and still have the same efficiency. So that's how you draw a list in immediate mode. I, I don't know if how many of you have tried to make lists in other languages, but there's. Uh, usually something with an adapter involved, and you have to get a callback and so on. So this is a very explicit way of doing it. You're using the Go control structures, in this case just a for loop, to go through the visible uh, elements and then simply draw that element, and that's it. So now, let's say that you want to handle events yourself. In this case, the list takes events from the queue, and handles it. it. It detects scroll wheels, it detects flings on the phones, and so on. But let's say you, you want to uh, react to uh, input events yourself. So let's try to add a button, a simple icon button. And let's have that button drawn on top of everything else as a beginning. It'll come up there. Did everyone see that? I think I'm too, I was too quick. It will appear up here. Let's just leave it there for a moment. And let's say you want to react to clicks to this. And the usual way, at least with the frameworks I've been using, you will have to register a callback somewhere to get back click events for this widget. With an immediate mode library, you ask for the events that you, where you need them. So you ask where are, what are the available events at the point where you want your application wants to process them. And in this case, let's say this button adds more rows to the list. So let's say the list, the number of rows in this list is specified by the uh, variable n. And let's start with a low number. And at this point, just before drawing the actual list, you would like to handle events, and not some other time when the callback decides to call you back. And the way you do that is you for through the available events, saying uh, with the name, uh, in this case, e. As, and as long as there are more events from the button, as returned by the next method, given the input queue, you would like to continue pulling out events from this button. The reason that, that I duplicate these two uh, next calls is that otherwise you have to use uh, three lines to exit out of the for loop. But the style is up to you. And in this case, I know that the events that we get back from this button is of the type gesture click event. So you have to check if this is actually a click or just a press. So we'd say if this event's type is a click, 
will simply increase the number of rows. Like this. So you can see the button reacts to a user input. It can actually animate itself by asking the system to redraw itself. And for each event that you receive, you add another uh, label. And just for posterity, let's, as a final thing, lay out the button in the southeast corner. Like this. And like this. Dimensions. There you go. So this is, if you squint a little, you can actually see the beginnings of uh, an app that looks a bit like Scatter. And that's actually how I, uh, I slowly built up this chat application that you saw earlier. So let's say we have this finished app, and we would like to not only run it on the desktop, but we'd also like to run it on the mobile phones. And that's, luckily for you, it's also provided, it's very difficult to do with, I th in, at least in my opinion, to, to do with Android Studio and Xcode. So what I wanted to do is, again, do it everything from Go, and then have a very simple command like the Go tool, where you just go build, go install, and go run. For example, this program, we can just run with Go run this package, and you will have this application. I would like to have something similar for um, the mobile uh, platforms. So there's a tool included with Giu, which is called Giu, where you can call it by giving it a target. Um, in this case, let's just use Android, which will then build your program for Android and packages, package it into an APK, which is the format that an Android phone or a similar uh, simulator will accept. You can then use the, in, in the, the standard ADB, ADB tool to install this APK, like this. And if we, we are very lucky, it will appear in the program list, like here. Again, we have the three rows. And we can just... <laughs> but Android is easy in this respect, because as you all know, if you've ever done anything with iPhone, it's very, very difficult to get anything to work in that, in that, on that platform. Uh, it's very difficult to get on the App Store. So, well, the Gear tool comes to your rescue, target iOS, and then, again, this directory. And because Apple is, ma has made their uh, system so that the simulator is subtly different from the device, you have to decide, uh, you have to give the Gear tool um, you have to specify to the Gear tool whether you want to build for a simulator or you, whether you want to um, build for a device or the App Store. And you, give, and you say that by specifying the output to be either an IPA, if you like to have it installed on your device, or an app directory if you want, to, want it to run in a simulator. And then there's a, a tool included with Xcode where you can install to the booted simulator this live app. So it appeared here. Again, three rows, and you can just add more, and you can scroll it, and you can do everything you want. The reason that it's, it's squished up on the side is that the, the mobile devices will specify an inset where you have to move all your drawing to be inside. But you also want to be draw, drawing outside this if you have a scrolling list. So that's why GIU allows you to draw all the way to the edges. So that's fixed in, uh, that, is, that is handled in the Scatter app, but it's not handled by this very simple app. And finally, the Gear tool supports building for the browser in the sense that it will build a WebAssembly module as, and it will add the required support files to actually serve that module and run it in your browser. So let's try that as the final thing. Target.js, again, this one, this package and it will output a directory with the, the, the WebAssembly module as well as the HTML file and JavaScript file for running it. And I have a very simple uh, web server running that just takes one directory, which is the one that you want to serve to the browser. 
There you go. And with that, you can just start localhost, connect to localhost 8080, and you have your program running in the browser. Again, it's the same code built for, is it five, four, four or five platforms right now? And you can have the button working as you would expect, and you can also, if we had rows enough, you can scroll inside the browser. So I think that is about it. If you're not convinced at this point, <laughs> <laughs> I would just, I would like to reiterate what the features of Geo are. Uh, so the immediate mode design is the most important thing, as aspect for me. So the other things, uh, writing in Go, being portable is very, very important. But in, the, in programming user interfaces and apps in, in, in general, I think the frustration of using some other uh, frameworks is simply not there in the same level if you can just draw and state what you want to have drawn and displayed on the screen. So I think the immediate mode design is a big thing for me. But if you just want to have something to run that you can write and go and is portable across all platforms, then the queue is there for you. And of course, even on lower end devices, mobile phones and, and devices with very, very weak CPUs, Every, all drawing is done with the graphics card, so you shouldn't be too worried about your program drawing too slowly to keep up with the user interface. And finally, if you, do, if you think that this is interesting for the portability, but perhaps not for the immediate mode design and so on, all the, the source code is, is, is published on the, as an unlicensed, which means that you can simply take whatever you want without any attribution whatsoever. So use whatever you like, all of it I prefer, of course, but if you just need, for example, the app package for drawing a window everywhere, then you can do that. So thank you very much for listening, and go to geoui.org if you want to see more about the Geo library itself, or go to scatter.im if you just want to run or uh, have your beta version installed on your phone. I will just have one little warning. It will ask you for your login details to your SNTP and IMAP server because it uses that for sending and receiving messages. Please don't give it your main account because I can not guarantee that it won't mess something up. So use something that you're, where you don't care about the emails inside it, okay? So thank you very much. <laughs>